That's fine. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, we thank Thee today above all things for Jesus Christ, the Son of God, who died at Calvary to redeem us back into this wonderful fellowship. And we are very grateful for his blessings on us at this present time. Now, our beloved president of this country, and we're grateful to him, Father, for when he was brought in, the wars ended, and now it seems like the peace talk has settled in Russia and many great things. And we love him, Father, as a leader of our nation. And we hear that he's had a heart attack, and we understand that he's a Christian and he loves you. And to him, Father, we are, we are grateful for all he's done, and we need such a person this day as a, a leader in our nation. And as brethren together, we offer a prayer to you for his deliverance, that you will heal him solid, sound, and well, that these uh, afflictions upon him will only be brought around to draw him closer to you, to know that... All he must do is to rely upon thee. And may he hurry back to the White House, Father. And may all the days of his reign here on earth, may there be peace among the nations. Grant it, Lord. And let man get a taste of what will be when the great Lord of heaven shall come to Lord Jesus. And then peace shall reign in every heart. And there will be no more wars. Grant these blessings, Father, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. May be seated. I was just a little late to hear, I guess, the singing, and I met Brother Wormel outside, and I don't see Brother Egberg, so I guess I missed it again today. I like that singing, good old-fashioned singing. Say, you got quite a few preachers here, I'll say that. It's very fine to see this fine convention, and it's my uh, great opportunity today to, to address you, speak to you about the Lord which I know many of you could tell me about it. And uh, I'm just a baby to many of you, and when it comes to addressing ministers, I'm very kind of a little shy about that, but you're told that uh, faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and my friend Joseph sure used some of that the other day. When he gave out in the meeting at the... Uh, he never asked me if he said, now, can I announce it? I said, no, Brother Joseph. <laughs> but after he'd done announced it, well, uh, what did I do but come over? So <laughs> you uh, have to bear with me a little while, if you will. I'll be so kind to do it. And this afternoon to speak a while, and then tonight, uh, get ready for tonight's service. We're all so grateful for this great move of the Lord God and this, and this convention here and the Philadelphian church for Brother Jose, for all the staff, and the peoples of Chicago and around about. We're grateful to you people. To my opinion, it's such things as this year that keeps the backbone in America. We wouldn't have any America if there wasn't any Lord Jesus here to help us be America. After all, the backbone of every nation is its morals. When the morals drop in a nation, then the nation's gone. Motherhood broken. You just might as well fold up. All other nations have done it, and ours is no exception. And we believe that the, the great time when arms will be stacked for the last time and the taps will sound for the last time is soon at hand when King Jesus shall come and take over the reign here on earth. And we're all looking for that. And that's why these conventions are held, and that's the reason that we're all gathered together, because we have things in common to talk about. Of course, our key note is Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And I would look at present times, at the things that is now, I would be a very discouraged person. But I learned a lesson one time, a little thing that I heard a man say. They were going to give away a swim bicycle to the best rider. I don't know whether I ever quoted it in this church or among these people or not. But a boy that could ride a, a 12-inch plank, 100 yards, could get a, a new swim bicycle. And many of the boys around the city 
they thought they could ride it and it was going to win the contest. And they had one little boy there who was kind of a sissy. Well, they were sure he wasn't going to win it. So all the boys got on the one by one to try to ride it, and all of them fell off but the little sissy boy. He rode on to the end of the plank, got off, won the Schwinn bicycle. All the other boys got around and said, how did you do it? He said, now, fellas, I'll tell you what you've done. He said, when they started you off, they give them a little push so they could get started, hold them up, let them start. He said, you were looking down like this, trying to keep your bicycle on the board. He said, I never noticed down here. I see you do that, it makes you nervous. And said, you fell off. He said, I just put my eyes on the end and kept going towards the end. That's it. If we look right around here, brethren, we get nervous. But let's look at the end. <laughs> at the end. Brother Jack was just quoting at the dinner table today uh, something that struck real down deep in my heart. And it said that a little boy was lost, I believe it was in Ireland or Scotland one, and he didn't know how to find his way back. So the people were getting around him and trying to find He said, well, said, in the city he lived in, over the hill somewhere, well, there was a great big cross. But if you just show me that cross, then I can go home. That's right. That's right. If you can show me the cross, I'll find my way home. That's, that's the way home, isn't it? Amen. Now, I don't know to speak to an audience like this. Uh, I just thought I'd read a little verse or two of Scripture here and then maybe speak on the Word just for a few moments in my own old-fashioned sassafras way of doing it. And so uh, over in Hebrews, the 10th chapter and the 19th verse, we read this, Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest by the blood of Jesus. Let's ask our Lord to bless His Word. Father, we are so grateful to have the Word, for faith cometh by hearing the Word. And we as your servants today, as men and women sitting here, come in out of the field to refresh ourselves in this convention. We pray, Heavenly Father, that you will come to us again this afternoon as thou hast always done, for you promised you would, and would bless us together today. And let thy word find its resting place in every heart. For we ask it in Jesus' name, amen. I would thought maybe uh, just knowing last evening and never prepare anything, because it's usually something else when I get there. But just happen to think on this having boldness to enter into the holiest of holies by the blood of Jesus Christ. I thought we might take a little text this afternoon for a few moments on a hidden life. Now, most all of us are in these conventions and so forth to try to find out how to have a closer walk with God. I'm sure that's your brother's uh, 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 way this afternoon. Now, I was thinking maybe I'd talk about the supernatural and... I don't know how to approach that. It's just as much mysterious to me as it is to you. And I um, thought well, then, a hidden life with Christ, some way that we could hide away and get away from all of it and live with Christ. Am I looking at Henry Grote? God bless you, Brother Henry. I haven't seen you for a long time, and brother. I just happened to look back and see Dad and recognize him. When I had my great break down or come off the field for about eight months, they were a real brother and daddy to me. They stayed right with me all the time. I never will forget the day that Brother grew up there. We went out in the cornfield to pray. I was so nervous. I stayed in the vision so long I couldn't tell whether it was in or out. I never will forget Brother grew up when he knelt down to pray with me, put his arms around me. Just simple like, said, now, Papa God, will you come help Brother Branham? <laughs> Papa God. Will you come help Brother Brandon? That's always stay with me, Brother Grote. <laughs> oh, what will it be, Brother Grote, someday? I hope to have my arm around you, sit down with the evergreen trees where the fountains of the waters of life is flowing from under the throne. We will be in the presence of our Papa God, then forever and forever to live in his presence. 
Now, God has made it so simple and of the Bible, and to make the gospel so simple to even a person like myself that's uneducated uh, would have an opportunity to speak uh, and preach the gospel. And uh, I was saying to the brethren coming over, uh, how funny I feel to get up there today and know that before scholars and some of the smartest men in the country sitting here, and how my grammar, how poor it is, and how all unqualified. But you know, probably you all feel this like I do if you had to sit before some bishops and so forth. But you know, brother, God doesn't dwell so much in theology. He dwells in love and humbleness, where you can really, everybody can get acquainted with him and know him. I'm so glad that he's, he hasn't selected just a little handful or a certain denomination. He said, whosoever will. And so that even gives me and you a chance to come in and have fellowship and speak of him. Now, God has made it so wonderful that in the Old Testament, he, where usually I go to for refuge for a text once in a while, he's made the Old Testament in parables and in a symbolic forms to express itself and his doings that the simple-minded might be able to have a conception of his will and what he's done. Many times in the Old Testament, how I have went back to find the old typing the new, always God did in what he's doing now in the New Testament, he foreshadowed it in the Old Testament. And all of those who neglected God and forsaken God in the Old Testament, we can see by example what become of them and those who dared to have faith in Jehovah and stepped out in the Old Testament, we see what happened to them. Now we make our choice. And we are, thank God for a free nation and a place of worship to where we each one can set our sails in the faith of God and fly away from this earth. I'm glad of that today, for there's plenty of places you couldn't do that. Now, for instance, in the Old Testament, how God gave all of his uh, parables back there and set forth his, his uh, things that would be a shadow of today, then that's the only way that I can teach the Bible. They talk about big Greek words and so forth. They just tie me in all kinds of places. But if I look back and see what God did back there as a foreshadow, then I have some general conception of what he's doing today. Because that was a shadow. If I'm going to the, uh, to the west and my sun's rising in the east and my shadow is before me, and if I'd never seen myself or never known what I looked like or a human being, I'd have some conception of my form when I seen my shadow. And the Old Testament is the shadow of the coming of Christ and everything foreshadowed the cross. And in Christ, all God's redemption, all of his plans, all the plan of salvation, all was met at Calvary. Now, how beautiful in the Old Testament, how God foreshadowed this Holy Spirit that we're enjoying today. How that he foreshadowed the order and these conventions and how we could come together in fellowship and have a, a fellowship together. Back there, we see how in the early beginning of the, of the church, that how that God foreshadowed the place today where I think, brethren, that we're entering now for this next blessing, everyone knows that we're just on a, a, a borrowed time like the great blessing of divine healing and the powers of the supernatural that's gone out, that's brought about a revival, that's actually shook the world the hardest it's ever been shook in all the, all the times. There has never been a time in any age that Christianity shook the entire world like it has in the last five or six years. Right? In every nation under every place, through radio, through by evangelists, by uh, we go into a place in different countries where they don't believe in God, and 
There they find where the ordinary missionary passed out some tracts, which is fine, but when they see the operation of the supernatural, tens of thousands of heathen fall at the cross and serve the Lord Jesus. It's been a mighty move. Now we've held this ground so long, and I believe with all my heart that we're on the threshold of stepping into another veil yonder, somewhere where the greater mysteries of God will be known to the church. And me, for one, I've got both ears and eyes and heart open to hear the message when he comes. Examine it, for Satan will put out on many a false runner. But just lay it aside. Remember, it's only signifying that something real is going to take place when you see it. For Satan will do everything, as I said last night, to blockade the real jewel of God when it's coming forth. You'll, you'll hear it. He put out a blockade to catch Abel. He put out one to catch Joseph, one to catch Jesus, and so forth. And he'll do it. One to get Moses. For you can notice those things that Satan will try to block it. And as for, I believe that the many cults and things as we see rising over the nation is only a light post to say, look out, it will be here soon. I've noticed among our brethren that many of you as coming into you as full gospel people coming from the Baptist church myself and accepting the doctrine of the baptism of the Holy Spirit being a separate uh, work of the Holy Spirit. And I thought then, when we, when the Martin Luther reached justification by faith, he thought that settled it. That was a light for his day. And he preached it and believed it and held on to it. And it was the light of that day. Then he entered another veil, a man, John Wesley, when Calvinism began to sweep the nation and it settled down to saying what God's going to do, you'll do, and does us no good to have a revival. God raised up John Wesley. And he certainly smashed Calvinism to the ground, to the place where it ought to have its right balance. Under the works of sanctification, the second work of grace. Nazarenes carried it on, and along come the Pentecostal, then next, and the baptism of the Holy Spirit, moving on up into higher height. And now, when the brethren received the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they said, This is the summit. This is all of it, but brethren, that's wrong. There is no summit to God's power. We move on and on and on. It's the unlimited resources of God has never been tapped yet. Blessings and powers that we know nothing about has never been even revealed to archangels is laying just ahead for his church that will believe. For eye has not seen, ear has not heard, ear has it entered the hearts of man what God has for them in store that love him. So let's move up and claim our rights as God opens the gates and swings out the welcome mat. Let's move on up into deeper depths and never colonize ourselves to organize ourselves and to get into a place where this is, we believe this and that's all. Let's believe this plus how much more we can hear from God. I think that ought to be the motive of every man and woman that loves the Lord Jesus. They'll receive all that you can from the hand of his bountiful mercies. Ah, it's my heart. That's the reason I never joined any organization or took sides with any groups, because I wanted myself wide open for the love of God and for what he could give to me. I noticed in the Bible one time, speaking just for a few moments now, in the Old Testament when a son was born into a home, he was a son when he was born. He become a son when he was born into a home. In the ordinary, typical Oriental home in those days, the son was giving a place and a tutor that raised the child. Paul beautifully speaks of it in the New Testament, that how the tutor was to raise the child, and we were the law was a tutor to bring us to Christ. But then that child, when he was born, was in type of the church today, the born again by the Holy Spirit. And I believe God has been tutoring his church, bringing it up, raising it up to its time now for something else to happen. The church ought to be grown by this time. But many of us who ought to be teaching others are yet desiring to censor milk of the Bible. See, we need someone to teach us when we should be teachers. 
And to that I bow my head in shame that I should know more about God than I do. Now, here's one thing that I do believe that when a child, the Bible speaks back there, that when the child had been raised, the tutor kept the father posted on the conduct of the child. Now, the tutor in this manner has been the Holy Spirit to the Pentecostal and the church. The Holy Ghost that give, remember, the child, no matter what would ever take place, it was born a child, it will always be a child. And when a man is born of the Holy Ghost, he becomes a child of God. For it is actually a second birth, a regeneration that creates something in the man that wasn't there to begin with. Whenever a man is born into the household of faith, he becomes a child. Then the Holy Spirit follows this man and brings word to God how he is progressing. Now, after this child become of age, now he's still a child. But if the child was reckless and never paid any attention and wasn't so interested in the father's work, that child never become adopted to that family. But if he was a correct child, a good child, and loved the work of his father and was interested and tried to do all he could to progress his father's work, then the tutor brought that word to the father, and there was what's called the placing of the son, or as Paul gives it in, over in Galatians, the adoption, that we was predestinated unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ. The adoption. Now the same son that was born into a family could be adopted into the same family, or placed in the same family, or give a position in the family that he was born into. And I do believe that that is the work of the Holy Spirit today among the church, is trying to place in the church positionally apostles, teachers, prophets, and so forth, as, and we've seen many false alarms and so forth moving amongst the people, which only indicated that the real genuine adoption was at hand. Amen. I believe it. God has to place into the church. That's the business of God, not of man. Now, when this boy became of age, and when he was ready then for his uh, adoption, and he had proved by the tutor, had told the father that this boy was eligible for adoption, he was taken out into a public place, and there he was robed with a, a robe, an honor robe, perhaps purple, or some color of royalty and was set up, and the whole city, all the people around about, seen the father adopt his own son into the family. And then when he was adopted into the family, already a son, already a child, already an heir of grace, but placed in the family. You get it? Now, when he was placed in the family and given his position, then that boy's name on a check was just as good as his father's name on the check. Now, I believe that that is the time that the church has arrived at today, that the next great move in the church is for God, after we've seen the false alarms. But now God will place in his church correctly. Apostles, prophets, teachers, evangelists, not man-made seminary bought and, but God will place into the church. Not theology runovers and overnights, but God will place in the church as God has chosen, as the Holy Ghost has tutored this church and raised it up, and in there God will adopt into, his, into the position his son. They're already his sons. But whether they are worthy of the position that he has for them. If you'll notice in a perfect type, God did his own son the same way. He taken three as a witness where the mouth of two or three witnesses ever were to be established. Peter, James, and John. Love, faith, and hope. And he taken them up into a mountain apart from the rest of the world. And there 
before official witnesses, God adopted his own son. He was transfigured before them, and his raiment did shine as the sun. And a voice out of a cloud said, This is my beloved son. Hear ye him. Set him up on the mountain. Put the witnesses there to see it. Hold him in a robe as bright as the sun, shining in the, and it's, they even shine like the sun in its strength. And God spoke out, said, This is my beloved son, hear ye him. God adopted his own child into the family. Hear me no longer, but this is my son who takes over from here on. Amen. That adoption is near the time and parable of the church. It's time for that. Now, let's drop back to the hidden life and find out what this is going to require to get into this place of adoption. A hidden life, we realize that in the Old Testament, under the Mosaical laws, we found out in there, any reader knows that there were three Two veils, two compartments, and a congregation in the, the setup of God's tabernacle in the wilderness. The first was the congregation, then the holy place, then the holiest of holies. That's God's house. That's God's dwelling place. That's your dwelling place. Now, you only live in a three-room house, remember. You may have two bedrooms, you may have three kitchens, but you only live in a three-room house. God lived in a three-room house. When God was here on earth, he occupied a three-room house, the soul, body, and spirit of Jesus Christ. In the temple, temple he, he was in a congregation, a holy place, and a holiest of holies. Each one of them was separated one from another, and each one had different furniture in it to show the dwelling place. A very beautiful type of the church. The sinner first comes into the, uh, the kitchen, as it was. The kitchen's where you eat. The living room is where you commune. And the bedroom is where you rest. Oh, God. See? The sinner comes in. Faith cometh by hearing. Hearing of the Word. He comes and eats the Word. Then he's baptized into the faith and accepts Christ as personal Savior, brings him in then to commune with God. But then he moves on into the bedroom, the still quietness with God, where all the things of the world is shut out, and he's alone in the stillness with God. Brethren, sisters, that's the place this Pentecostal move ought to be today. Uh, not so much babbling, we're, we're Trinity, we're Methodists, we're Assemblies, we're Church of God. We are to be alone in that quiet stillness with God. Don't you believe it? Yes. Certainly we ought to be. Notice when the high priest once the year entered in the first veil, then the second veil. On the outside at the levers where they washed the sacrifice, then the sacrifice was killed, put on the brazing altar, and the blood was put in a charger, and the high priest once the year walked in behind the veil to make an atonement. And notice the dressing of this high priest before he could enter the veil. He had to be stripped and dressed right to go in. That's what the church is today. What it needs is a stripping off of all these little cults and things and dressed in the righteousness of Jesus Christ and ready to enter in. His walk must be different. Every, along the hems of his garment, he had a pomegranate and then a bell. And as he walked, his walk was so perfect until the bells played holy, holy, holy unto the Lord. What we need today is not whether we are assemblies or church of God or oneness or whatever it might be. Our walk ought to be playing to the public, holy, 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 unto the Lord. 
Another thing, he must be anointed before he goes in. The anointing oil was made with the rose of Sharon, and the crushing of the rose brought forth the perfume, and they put it on the oil that run on Aaron's beard, plumb to the hems of his skirt, covered all over with the anointing oil, walking right, living right, moving right, dressed right. There he went, taking before him the blood, and as he went behind the curtain into the third room, there was a veil that dropped behind him that the outside world could not see him no more. And every man or boy or woman or girl that ever is anointed of God and walks behind that temple, the veil of God, the Holy Ghost, puts him in a secret place. The veil drops behind him, and the world and all of its things are cut off behind him. That's the reason, brethren, that we're holding up the adoption of God as our difference of life and fussing and quarreling amongst one another is the reason the veil can't drop behind us and we can go into that presence of God. That's right. We're so interested in our denominations. We're so interested in what the next fellow. What, what is that to thee, follow thou me? It's an individual affair between every minister. How a minister ought to always get along to himself, even before he preaches, before he prays, before he does anything. He should get along with God in that quiet place, hid away with God. How that, that veil once coming down. Now, the furniture in this inside this veil was different from the outside. Way back in the congregation, the laver that washed the beast. In the next veil was what? It was the, um, the burning of the beast's body. And in there was the seven golden candlesticks on the, that represented the lamp and gave the light. And out into the outer course was sunlight. In the first veil was artificial. Notice, and when they walk in here by this lamp, then they go into the next court which was the holiest of holies, as they walked in there anointed. How that God has so planted out is such a beautiful thing for us as we see the great plan there of God's eternal salvation. How that his ministers should walk in this. How they should prepare themselves to enter into this. Now on the inside of this inner court the, called the holiest of holies, there was a piece of furniture sitting there called the mercy seat. And the covenant was in the ark. And the ark had two cherubims. And it was on the inside. That was the furniture inside of the holy place. Next coming out was the golden candlesticks. Then on out to the laver. Now it perfectly represents the age of Luther, Wesley, and Pentecost. Exactly. The three steps are dispensations of his grace that's been given to mankind. We are in the last dispensation. I believe that with all my heart. See? Now, notice, then also, in this great move, how God brought them in there, in this great uh, place, Moses one time was told by God when the manna began to fall, the manna was a type of life. Christ coming down from heaven and perishing here on earth that he might give us life. The manna came from heaven, laid on the earth, and the people eat it to sustain life. Christ came down from heaven and become manna that we might live by him. And notice, now the people eating the manna, they had to get it quickly and eat it. Because when the sun rose, it wasn't long till it was perished. The type there of Christ, the Holy Spirit, the manna was a type of the Holy Ghost today. As God brought the church in natural with natural manna, he's bringing the church today spiritual on spiritual manna. When the church had first overcome, come over the Red Sea, type of the blood, passed over into the journey on the road to the promised land, manna reigned the first night. Amen. And when the church was passed over from life unto death on the day of Pentecost, God rained the spiritual manna out of heaven 
that sustain the church until Jesus comes again or we pass into the millennium, into the promised land? Amen. Oh, when they picked it up and they would eat it, they said it was sweet. It tastes like honey in the rock, they said. Tastes like honey. David called it honey in the rock. And that's what it is. Now notice a type. The manna never did cease to fall until the day they entered the promised land for 40 years. The same manna fell every day. Hallelujah! How are you going to take the Holy Ghost and leave it at Pentecost? Brother, it's been one continually Pentecost that caused the hardness of man's heart to fail to eat the manna. That's right. Notice, then it was a pipe. Now on the day of Pentecost, when our manna, as soon as the people that went into the upper room and obeyed the commandments of the Lord Jesus and tarried, waited at the city of Jerusalem for the going forth of the Holy Ghost the first time, there came from heaven a sound like a rushing mighty wind that filled all the house where they were setting cloven tongues set up on them like fire. They were all filled with the Holy Ghost and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Out into the streets they went. A cowardly little bunch of preachers hid away in an upper room. But all of a sudden there came the manna come pouring down to sustain their souls. And out into the streets they went with an experience that they had never had before. A beautiful type of... God sustaining His church through this journey to the promised land. Notice, brethren, then how long was this manna to last? It lasted the entire journey until they hit into another dispensation, over into the promised land. How long is this to last? Until Jesus comes. Peter said, Repent, every one of you, and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins, and you shall receive the Holy Ghost for the promises unto you and to your children and to them as far off, even as the many as the Lord our God shall call. How long was it to last? As many as the Lord our God shall call. And as long as the dispensation of grace lasts, God will still call men and women to His service. So the Holy Ghost is just as real today. Now, He never said now, when they eat this manna, remember, if they eat it, many people eat it and said, this is it. They had to gather it fresh every day. That's right. That's right. They had to gather the manna fresh every day because along about nine o'clock on their second step, it would go to mountain. It would perish. And many times people living in God's second room, even in communion, after they've already received the word and come into the second step of receiving Christ into their life and never yet know what that secret room is, what that bedroom, what that rest place is, they eat the manna. But did you notice, if they let it lay too long, it finally melted out. There was, it perished away. And I think a lot of people has had a lot of campground cramps anyhow. That when they go and eat of the Lord on the campground and before another revival can come along, they're all back and twisted up in some kind of cult or something else. What's the matter, brother? You've never walked in somewhere else. God said, Moses, make you a golden pot. Hallelujah. And in there, place this manna. And remember that a believer, when he walked in there, that manna never did run out. It was always fresh and new and sweet. As the days went by, as the years went by, and any man who comes to Christ and hides away and the veil falls behind him, he's in the presence of Almighty God, eating the manna day and night from one hour to the other. It's always just as sweet as it was the first day it fell into your soul. That's what we need today is get in where the things are at. Not stand off and pretend or not stand off and act, but actually get in there. Amen. The man wants now, remember, only believers, only the elect comes into that, that God has chosen you. I believe in Revelations 2, said, He that overcometh. So it's promised to overcomers. You said, Oh, I overcome smoking. That ain't what he's talking about. <laughs> the whole lot more goes to this Christianity besides 
not smoking cigarettes or drinking whiskey. Amen. He that overcometh shall inherit all things, and he'll be my son. I'll be his God, and, listen, I will give him of the hidden manna. Amen. 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 I'll hide him away, and I'll give him the hidden things. The world on the outside of the curtain don't know nothing about it. Hallelujah! Though they eat manna, but they don't know about this, I'll give to him the hidden manna. I'll give him a stone with his name in it. (laughs) You get what I mean? Entering in to the adoption or the hidden place with God. Ministers of the gospel don't care about your denominations and what the world thinks, but seek to enter in to the hidden manna. Where the full revelation of God is made love perfect in your heart and you and God and everything else is at rest. Let anything come what may you're hidden away. What a place to live. Oh, that's let me abide there. As the song said, let me rest neath the tree where the so freely flows, where the lamb is the light. And the soul of the saved never die. Amen. Sure, they ate men out there, but they didn't know about this. They'd never been in there. Have you, my dear brother, don't despise my ignorance, but I want to ask you something. Have you ever come to the place in life where Christ meant more to you than all the arguing you could do about your church? Has Christ meant more to you than all the world? I don't mean from any emotion or a mental workup. I mean from the depths of your heart that something's settled in there. That the, something's taken place that you don't know how it come, but you're hid away and your whole motive is to serve Jesus Christ. Have you entered that place, my dear brother? Have you come into that place where you don't care what anyone says, not to go out and act smart? But the little love of God is so anchored into you that you can't see nothing else. Your whole motive is to do the will of God. Love for everybody flowing free from everywhere. What a place to live. That's the hidden place. That's the place where we got to come to, my brethren. That's the place where God reveals his secret things. That's the place where God does the placing and the calling. You get what I mean? In this same place, we don't have much time because I've got to hurry, but just for another thought, in this same place, they put Aaron's rod to make a decision who God had chosen, who he hadn't. And that rod that was a dead stick and one night's time come to life, brought buds, brought flowers, and brought alms. It both come to life, brought blossoms, and yielded fruits. A very typical pattern of the sinner being brought to God into the holy place. Remember, that rod passed over every one of those other elements. And it got inside the holy place still dead. But to abide... It never come to life when he first brought it in there. That's the reason the Holy Spirit's watched you since you received the Holy Ghost. See your attitude towards his kingdom. If it's been selfish motives, if the things that you thought of is to further the denomination, or if it's to further better you, your position, if it's to make you a man looked up to in the world, if it's to build you a big church somewhere, or some popularity or some other thing outside of increasing or embittering the kingdom of God, brother, something's wrong. Amen. Amen. Now, when that old dead rod was brought in there and laid in the presence of God himself, what happened? It budded. It blossomed. And it yielded fruit. Showing that we born in that rod was off of an almond tree. 
And when it was cut off, it died. And when man was cut off from God, he died spiritually. But once brought into the place of God, before the presence of God, he comes to life. And he yields life. He yields blossoms. He yields fruit. Jesus come to the tree to look for fruit on it. It had everything but fruit. And that's what's the matter with our churches today. We got everything but fruit. We can shout. We can speak with tongues. We can argue the scriptures. We can teach our theology. But when it comes to fruit bearing, the tree is very lean. What is the fruits of the Spirit? Love, joy, peace, long-suffering, gentleness, goodness, patience. It shows many is still outside. On the first altar, you're still open to the public. You're still listening to hear what John's got to say about it, what the neighbor will think, or something for yourself. But once behind the veil and the curtains is dropped, you're hitting God to Christ. See? Notice what a beautiful picture of the sinner laying in the presence of God. Now this rod laying there, it was refreshed. It was fragrant, brought the fragrance of the blossom, and it yielded fruit. The buds came forth. Now, a beautiful type of that is given, earthly speaking. The first thing that we have to do before we can have a crop, we have to have seed. And the seed placed in the ground will yield its fruits. Is that right? Now, the first thing we have to do is to receive Christ. Now, the tree had to be an almond tree to start with. And Christ, you have to receive Him before you come into this place. And then in the presence of this great God, then these things take place. What see the Word. Christ was the Word. In the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God. Christ comes into the life of the human being. Now notice, the first thing was a refreshment. What makes the seed grow? Did you ever get up of a morning and find the dew that fell down from heaven and refreshes the earth? How does it refresh it? When it's at peace. The dew don't fall in daytime. The dew falls in the nighttime when everything is at peace. The dew can never fall on you, my brother, as long as you're fussing and arguing and stewing about the things here on this earth. Get on with God and let the dew drops of mercy fall upon you. In the stillness, precious memories, how they linger. How they ever fill my soul in the stillness of the midnight secrets unfold. How that God can get his believer with the curtains dropped around him alone to himself. He'll bring down a refreshing from heaven that there's no other person or no other way in the world to ever know it, only he that's laying there. Did you ever walk out of a morning in that real fresh, cool feeling? God has refreshed his earth. Fragrant. Did you ever go into a rose garden? Down my place, they got a lot of honeysuckles. The honeysuckle don't smell much along in the heat of the day, but it's early of a morning. When all the air has been purified, then that Romeo of the honeysuckle let a man be out fussing, fighting, stewing, and you'll never get much of a Roma from that of the gospel, but let him get alone one time in the stillness of God. Every man that comes to the pulpit ought to dwell alone first. Then comes the fruits. Yielding forth its fruits. Every man that stays in the presence of God into this great secret place hid away will yield the fruits of righteousness, peace, 
love, joy, long-suffering, goodness, gentleness, patience. Don't fuss about these other things. Get that in your life. And you'll never get it until you hide away with God into that land of adoption. Another thing we'll call your attention just before we close. Look at the light. On the outside in the courts, it was the firmament that lit it up. Sunlight and so forth. Some days it was cloudy. Some days the sun didn't shine at all. Some days it was dark. Now that's in the outer court. The next court was the lamp of God where the justified stands. And it was lit by human hands. That's where we argue our denominations, where we argue our differences, split hairs. And, oh, I don't believe in divine healing. I don't believe that visions come from God. I don't believe this. I don't believe that. You're arguing because you're living, yet you're eating manna, but you're living under artificial light. That's right. Sometimes the light goes out. Sometimes your lamp gets smoked up. But the he who desires to hide away, walk into the next place, there's no artificial light anywhere. But down in between the arch of the wings of these cherubims was a supernatural light hanging in there, which was a halo of God that lit the whole room. And a man once entered into that Shekinah glory, hallelujah, that news back there in the presence of dimness of this world and the artificial organizations and all man-made creeds has passed away and he's living in the Shekinah glory of Almighty God. My brethren, let's ask God for that place to live. Shall we stand? Oh, dear Jesus Christ, the Son of the living God, my dear brothers and sisters who are standing here now this afternoon in the housing place of this little church called the Philadelphia Church named after brotherly love, I pray thee, dear God, to be merciful from the pastor to every evangelist and ever noted pastor or teacher that's in divine presence. No, God, may the Holy Ghost wrap our hearts so tight against the cross until we'll grab it up. Self-sacrificial and rush to the Shekinah glory right quick. Where we'll not be running across the earth and splitting hairs with man and arguing about whether this is right or not, but live and abide in His presence and eat the manna that's been stored up there for those who are hid away with Him. Grant it, Lord. May that blessing fall on this convention and every man and woman go away from here, hid away under the Shekinah glory of Almighty God. Grant it, Father, I ask this blessing as your service for my brothers and sisters in Jesus' name. Amen. I believe. Oh, I want to see him look upon his face. Where to live forever by his saving grace on the streets of glory. Let me lift my heart on his own path. Hold that light ever to restore. Praise be to his name. ever to rejoice standing in the presence of the Shekinah glory that will never go out. This is my story. This is my song sang in His presence all praises all the day long. Perfect submission all is at rest. Me and my Savior forever are blessed. That's it. How we love Him. Don't you love Him? Amen. Oh, how I